We mentioned activation functions in passing earlier, but let's go into a little bit more depth as they are an important concept. It turns out there's many different kinds of activation functions you can choose from, and picking the right one can be important for the performance of your neural network. Now, an activation function is just the function inside of a given node or neuron, whatever you want to call it, that sums up all of the incoming inputs into that neuron and decides what output it should then send out to the next layer of neurons. So it's just that function that says, given the inputs, what should my output be? That's all an activation function is. Now, the simplest activation function is called the linear activation function. And all this does is output whatever it got as an input. It's just a straight line there. The problem with a linear activation function is that it doesn't really do anything. It's just uh, mirroring what came into it as an output. So as a result, it can't really do any interesting learning. It can't do any back propagation as it's actually going back and learning through the network and trying to optimize things. And also because it's just outputting whatever it got as an input, there's really no point to having multiple layers at all with a linear activation function. If it's just turning around and putting the input of one layer as the output to the next layer, there's really no point in having more than one layer because it's just gonna be the same thing all the way through. So linear activation functions actually aren't very useful. You don't really see these in action very much at all. Sort of the uh, close cousin to a linear activation function would be the binary step function. And all this does is say, well, if I have nothing coming in to the neuron, then I'm gonna output nothing. But if anything at all is coming in, I'm gonna output a positive value, that's a fixed value. So it's either on or off. The problem with this, well, there's a few problems. First of all, it can't handle any multiple classification. It's a binary function. It can only be on or off. It can only signal that this neuron represents one thing, right? So if you wanna say that a given thing belongs to multiple categories, there's no way to do that with a binary step function. It can only say that this belongs to a single category. But the bigger problem is it's something that has to do with mathematics and calculus. So as we're learning through this network, we have to do a bunch of derivatives on these uh, activation functions as we do so. And it turns out that vertical slopes and calculus really don't get along together. The derivative of that would be infinite, and that just causes your math to blow up. That's why in this particular instance here, you're seeing that the step function isn't quite a step. It's off to the side a little bit there. It has a little bit of a slant to it. That's just to make the math not explode. And when you find yourself doing things like that to just make things not explode, that might be nature's way of telling you that what you're building is not very stable, right? So again, binary step function is very simple in concept. It's kind of like where they started with uh, neural networks back when they were first being developed, but they quickly found that they were very limited and had these mathematical problems. So you don't really see them in use much today. Instead, we want to focus on nonlinear activation functions. And the benefit of a nonlinear function is that you can create these complex mappings between inputs and outputs. So there's more information there to be passed along from layer to layer. And because they have a useful derivative, they're not just you know straight lines that are horizontal and vertical, it allows you to do more interesting learning as you back propagate and learn how to optimize these weights between the layers of your network. Also, they allow for multiple layers because they aren't just a degenerate linear function that outputs whatever the input was. Because they're more complicated, you can actually have a benefit from having multiple layers to your neural network. So nonlinear is the way to go. So you might start with a function like this. And on the top here, we have what's called a sigmoid activation function, which is also known as a logistic activation function. They're the same thing. And at the bottom, we have what's called a tan h or a hyperbolic tangent activation function. Again, two different names for the same thing. The benefits of these are, like we talked about, they're nice and smooth. They have nice, pretty derivatives. And the only real difference is that the sigmoid function on the top, the logistic activation function, will scale the outputs between zero and one, whereas the hyperbolic tangent function will scale everything between negative one and positive one. And generally speaking, when you're dealing with machine learning, it's nice to have things with a mean around zero. So in practice, you'll find that the hyperbolic tangent function is the function of choice between these two. You don't really see sigmoid or logistic functions being used. More often, it's the hyperbolic tangent one that you're gonna see in this sort of a uh, environment. And they're very well suited to uh, recurrent neural networks as well. They have some problems though. So one problem is that as you get toward the extreme positive or negative values here of the inputs, uh, the output starts to change very slowly, right? So if you imagine these graphs stretching out even further to the left or the right, the change in those values becomes very, very small. And this is what we call the vanishing gradient problem. It's actually it gets to the point where numerical precision issues can become a problem at, at a given point. And we'll talk about the vanishing gradient problem in more detail later in the course, but this is where it comes from. That's one of the downsides of using a sigmoid logistic tan h or hyperbolic tangent activation function. They're also computationally expensive. Computers aren't very good at doing trigonometry very quickly. So if you do use a complex activation function like this, it tends to take a longer time for your neural networks to converge and to actually do their learning.
So an answer to that is what's called the rectified linear unit, or ReLU for short. This is a very popular choice these days. Very simple, as you can see, it's just a linear straight line on the positive side and just a flat zero on the negative side. So kind of has a lot in common with a binary step function, except it's not a step. It's actually more of a uh, slant off to the right there, right? The main benefit of this is that it's very easy and fast to compute. So computers are very efficient at computing straight lines, right? So as opposed to trigonometry. So it's very quick to have a uh, model converge using a simple function like this. So that's a good thing. And there's no vertical lines in this either. So we don't have to have any, um, you know, weird calculus problems resulting from vertical gradients and the infinities that result from that. There are some downsides, however, to ReLU, even though it is a popular choice and a very fast and efficient choice. And that's that when we have zero or negative values, we do degenerate back to a linear function here and all the problems that come along with that. This is known as the dying ReLU problem. And in a lot of cases, it's not really an issue, uh, but there are some models where that can actually cause trouble. So the solution to the dying ReLU problem is simply to not have it go flat on the negative side, but have it slope down at sort of a uh, shallow angle there instead. This just introduces a small negative slope when you go below zero on the x-axis. and Usually it's not as steep as that. Usually it's going to be a little bit closer to horizontal there, but that's the idea of leaky ReLU. Instead of a straight, flat, horizontal line to the left, we slow, slope it down a little bit instead. But how do you know what slope is best, right? Like you can just decide arbitrarily, and some people do that, but a better way would be something called parametric ReLU, or PreLU for short. And this is exactly the same thing as leaky ReLU, but the slope in the negative part is learned via backpropagation itself. So as we're going back and learning all the weights between the nodes in our neural network, we're also learning the optimal slope for that negative portion of the ReLU activation function. The downside, of course, is that this is very complicated and computationally intensive, so we're kind of throwing away some of the benefits of ReLU, and your mileage may vary. Different kinds of problems will benefit from this more or less than others, so you'll find that in the majority of cases, straight up ReLU or a constant leaky ReLU will fit the bill. But if you do need to do better than that, parametric ReLU or PreLU is worth exploring. And there are other variants of ReLU as well out there. One is called the exponential linear unit. That's shown on the top here, or ELU for short. This is, you know, like leaky ReLU, but instead of a straight line on the negative side, it's actually doing an exponential function instead. So again, calculus tends to favor these sort of smoother curves here. So that can sometimes work out better than leaky ReLU. Also on the bottom here, we have something that's pretty close to Swish. Um, this is a function that was developed by Google and it performs really well. Um, it's a good alternative to ReLU or leaky ReLU or any of this stuff. Mostly you see a benefit with Swish if you have really, really deep networks. You need to have like 40 or more layers to really start seeing a benefit from Swish. Now that said, Swish was developed by Google, not Amazon, so you're probably not too likely to see this come up on an Amazon exam, but good thing to know about anyway. One other variant is called max out, and that's a very simple function that just outputs the maximum of all of the inputs that came into that node. And technically, ReLU is a special case of that, mathematically speaking. However, max out doubles the number of parameters that you need to train it, so it's not really practical in practice. It's going to be very expensive to do, and, you know, it's usually not worth the effort of actually doing that. One more activation function we need to talk about is softmax, and you often see this as the final output layer of a multiple classification problem. So if you have a one-hot encoded classification, like, you know, what object is in this picture, things like that. Often you will see softmax applied as the activation function on the final output layer of that neural network. And what softmax does is it takes those outputs from that last layer and converts them into probabilities for each classification. So it allows us to take the output of um, this neural network that's trying to classify something and interpret those final outputs of the probabilities of that thing being in each one of those classifications. And if you need to choose, you know, which classification is the best guess, you can just take the maximum one out of that set of outputs. Uh, another thing is that, you know, it can't produce more than one label for something still. So if you do have a case where you want to say that this picture contains this thing and this thing and this thing, it can't really do that. It's going to pick one or the other. Uh, sigmoid activation functions, however, are good for more than one label for something, you know, multiple classification. Okay, so that's an important distinction. That's another thing that sigmoid is good for. Now, you don't have to worry about the actual guts of the softmax function itself for the exam. You just need to know what it's used for. It's for multiple classification and converting the outputs of a neural network into probabilities of each given classification that each neuron represents. So that's a lot of activation functions. How do you choose one? Well, it's not that hard, really. 
So if you're going to be doing multiple classification where you're just trying to pick one classification for an object, you want to use softmax on the output layer. That's what softmax is for. If you have a recurrent neural network, those tend to do well with TANH or hyperbolic tangent activation functions, two names for the same thing. For everything else, you probably want to start with ReLU. And if ReLU is not good enough, try Leaky ReLU. If Leaky ReLU is not good enough, try Prelu or maybe even Max Out. And if you have a really, really deep neural network with 40 or more layers, you might want to look at something like Swish instead. Also remember that sigmoid activation functions are appropriate if you need to assign more than one classification to the same thing. So that's it. That's what all the activation functions are, or most of them. There's, there's more that we didn't cover. Th those are the main ones, though, the popular ones, and how to go about choosing which one to use for a given problem. This uh, may come up on the exam, so make sure you understand this.